So as we covered um, earlier, there is no direct access to SPU, uh, to main memory. SPUs cannot directly address main memory. It's via DMS only. Um, when aliasing is set up, uh, then yes, SPE, uh, whatever SPE's local store is being aliased into the effective address space, that SPE will do the address translation. But normally, by default, there's no address translation. There's no visibility to main storage apart from DMA accesses. Again, another diagram to show the access methods. The blue lines over here, the blue lines indicate the DMA transfer paths between the SPE to another SPE or to a PPE, and access channels between the SPU and the local store, which is a 16 byte load and stores. And then um, from the local store to the, uh, from basically an SPE, also the SPE can talk to the IO, any memory mapped IO devices also. Coherence and synchronization, uh, you know, all transfers between the local store and the main storage are coherent. And it's, it's a necessary feature if you think about this architecture because there's, what, eight processing elements? All of them are mapped into the effective address space. Anyone can write into main memory. So obviously there was a need uh, for hardware enforced uh, uh, coherence protocol. So whenever there is a load at a particular request, uh, all the cached copies for data residing at that address are checked. And if there is any touched cache copy existing, first that value is written into the main memory, and then the load is completed. Basically a snoop mechanism. Um, each DMA command is tagged with a five bit tag ID. It's basically just an identifier to identify one particular DMA transfer. So all SPs can initiate DMA transfers. The PPE call can also initiate DMA transfers. However, the DMAs from SPEs only are uh, recommended. There's a few reasons uh, for that. Basically, there's more a SPEs, and the DMA, the command queue on the SPE side is bigger, 16 entries versus eight entries for the PPE command queue. Also, there's only one PPE dealing with everything, controlling tasks, switching, everything, right? Save if, if there's any context, save and restore that needs to be done. It, it's the only entity. So why load the PPE again with another task of initiating DMA? Another theory that we have is consumer initiated requests are more manageable. So SPE being the consumer of data, always should, have, should be initiating the DMA transfers. They are more effective. Uh, the peak bandwidth is higher when the SP, DMA is initiated by the SPEs. Uh, when the transfer size is a multiple of 128 bytes because they generate full cache line requests. And the addresses, the address offset in the main memory and the local store address offset both need to be a multiple, uh, uh, basically multiple of 128 bytes. <coughs> so, base, so in other words, we're not generating any partial cache line requests. All cache lines are 128 bytes. So that's the reasoning behind it. And these are the registers on the PPE. There's uh, different registers to handle floating point computations uh, versus fixed point. There's a condition register, typical uh, register format, you know, like in an Intel architecture. The PowerPC instruction sets, all instructions are four bytes long and they're all aligned on word boundaries. <clears throat> it supports byte, half word, word, and double word accesses to, the, to all the general purpose registers and supports word and double word operand accesses between a storage and a set of floating point registers. Signed integers are always represented in two's complement form. And um, there is a extensive vector or mu multimedia instruction set. So in other words, you can do vector, we can write vector code on the PPU also. However, what we really recommend is just to do all the vector computations. Because essentially when you're doing vector, you're trying to write some uh, effective high performance code. So you would want to do that on SPEs because they are more adept at handling uh, uh, compute intensive code. Again, these are the instruction types for reference. So there is cache control instructions available, flow control instructions available, uh, general load and store instructions, memory synchronization instructions, typical to a PowerPC architecture. Some more uh, user mode instructions. Again, the processing units in the PPU, the FXU fixed point unit, the floating point unit, the vector unit. 
there's some more instruction types. There is uh, all these. Ba basically, this the point of the, all this information is that there is support for all these instructions available. So your application could be anything. It be it could be an algorithm from the A and D space or from electronic design and automation or seismic or image processing. I mean, and, and it can be any application. And so the instruction set is capable of handling a diverse range of applications. The message we are continuously trying to send by doing all these workshops and, and uh, you know, contests and uh, these ecosystem related activities to send that PS, uh, cell is not just a PS3 or a gaming chip. When it was designed, the architects had it in their mind that it has to take technology and high performance computing to a totally different level by doing some kind of breakthrough design and uh, beating the competition that we face from all these SMP uh, architectures or multi other multi-core architectures. So again, when, we did, when you design this kind of breakthrough technology, obviously the programming will not be uh, as similar or common to the mainstream programming. So <laughs> that's why the need for this different kind of programming and DMAs and synchronization so it takes an, uh, a step more of effort to get the performance out of this hardware. Uh, PP has got its own C, C++ language extensions, vector data types. They're all, even on PPE, the vector data type is 128 bits, 16 bytes. So it can hold eight bit, no, 16 8-bit values, signed or unsigned, eight 16-bit values, four 32-bit values, and four single precision IEEE uh, floating point values. And there's three categories of intrinsics. Intrinsics is just instructions, like the VMX instructions. Um, specific instructions have a one-to-one -one mapping with a single assembly language instruction. Generic, they can map to one or more. Predicates, there is um, some conditional uh, kind of instructions that are called predicate instructions. Basically, they'll compare two values and generate a mask. And that mask will be used directly as a value to detect a condition or a branch. And this is how a VMX program would look like. The top part of this program just defines a union consisting of an integer uh, array, or four elements, and then there's a vector unsigned, in, a vector signed int, and then type def it to vec var. So the main program is initializing a vector. So this is how you would initialize a vector. So vconst is a type of structure, structure vvar, a vec var, and vconst of my vec would be initialized to four floating point values, two, 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 two. V1 is another uh, vector of type, uh, that union that we just defined, and load it, uh, initialize it with the different values, and then do a vec underscore add. So that vec underscore add is called a vector instruction or a VMX intrinsic. So basically with one instruction, in one cycle, which we're doing four additions, so which is the whole premise of data level parallelism or single instruction, multiple data. So with one single instruction, you're operating on four vector elements. So the result is stored in MyVec, and you can print it out the way it's showed in this program. So SPE registers is pretty much simpler than the PPE uh, register model. 128 registers, they're all, they all look the same, unified registers. So the same registers are used to do floating point or fixed point arithmetic. So SP executes both single precision and double precision floating point operations. And um, single precision, they would be operated, performed in a four-way SIMD fashion, just like a unsigned int or int. Uh, they're all fully pipelined. Double precision operations, however, are uh, partially pipelined. Uh, so this morning, I covered the even and odd pipelines, where you can place, you can run two instructions in one clock cycle one is, a, one is an even pipeline, you know, like an uh, arithmetic pipeline, and the other one is a for memory operations, right? So with double precision operation instructions, though, it cannot be run with any other instruction at the same time. So dual issue is not possible. Apart from that fact, once you execute a double precision uh, instruction, for the next six cycles, you cannot uh, execute any instructions of any other type. So there's a 13 cycle clock latency, seven cycles to perform the double precision operation, and then six as a uh, latency. So double precision right now on the current cell BE hardware is a little expensive, or it's not as good as single precision, but it's still pretty good by far, 
at par with other architectures. Only one rounding mode is supported. It's all uh, round towards zero. Um, D-normal operands are treated as zero. Uh, there is no support for um, infinity. There's no infinity or not a number. And just as I mentioned, no, the no other instructions are dual issued with double precision instructions. There are 13 uh, clock cycle latencies and um, only the final seven cycles are pipelined. And then after you execute a double precision op uh, instruction, you cannot execute anything else for six cycles. The SPE local store holds instructions and data. So in the 256 kilobytes of memory that you have, you have to fit the code and the data sections. The instruction prefetch will at least de deliver 17 instructions. But, and uh, because um, the DMA, every DMA operations, uh, operation happens once in eight cycles. So in other words, for a DMA write, a read, it's one by 16th, and for a write, it's one by 16th. So it doesn't really impact the usage of the single ported memory per se. And because there's only one single, it's, it, there's only one port for reads and writes, so there's and three different kinds of operations that have to go through that local store. Read DMA read and write, SPU load and store operations, um, and then instruction prefetch. The priority, however, the, however, the highest priority goes to DMA reads and writes, <coughs> and then loads and stores, and then instruction prefetch. The reason why the uh, loads and stores have a higher priority over instruction prefetch is because the load and store would at least help you with the program execution. It will take the program go further. Instruction prefetch, on the other hand, is speculative, right, most times. So even pipeline, by zero, and our pipeline, all the instructions, there's a program, programmer's handbook in the microelectronics website. Fully, it covers everything from architecture to coding standards to optimization uh, mechanisms to thermal and power monitoring to performance counters to virtual storage, everything. Uh, decrementers, hardware clocks, everything is covered in the handbook. Um, so, and a, a good part of the handbook also covers, over, looks, goes over the instructions and their clock cycle latencies and which pipeline they are issued in. The, all the op, uh, uh, data is big Indian on the PPU and SPU, and which means the MSB would be zero and the LSB would be the bit 128 or 127. Again, SP instruction data type, the names look the same. It's always vector following the data type. There's about 204 instructions, shift and rotate instructions. Uh, there is no um, rotate right. So when you have to rotate left, you just give it a negative um, index to do a rotate right. The synchronization and ordering instructions. And again, even in the SPU language extensions, there is three classes, specific, generic, and composite. Uh, the third category uh, is different. Third category is composite, which means um, it's basically a sequence of uh, two or more specific or generic instructions. Specific is uh, directly related to assembly level uh, instruction, and generic is basically one or more assembly level. The examples are also given. Any specific instruction will be proceeding with an SI underscore, and a generic would always be a SPU underscore, add, subtract, multiply everything. And this is how this data is stored in memory. Um, the first four bytes are called the preferred slot. So in other words, we, don't, we highly discourage the use of scalar data types on the SPUs. Right? We always we say just use vector because that's the way you will optimally use all the resources available to you. So if you have to have to use scalar data types, let always make sure that they are, the data always resides in the preferred slot, the first four bytes. Um, so that when there is, for, for example, I think uh, in the third um, presentation, we go over the SIMD uh, operations, but basically um, it helps with the alignment, it's less overhead for the compiler, it's just better for in terms of execution. So in, in other words, this is the byte, oh, let's see, this is one vector consisting of 16 bytes, which can store, you know, four integers or four floating points or two double words consisting of eight bytes each or one quad word. This is an example, a typical example of um, um, instruction. SPU underscore insert will insert a scalar into the vector D. SPU promote will, uh, will try to promote one scalar 
to uh, to a vector and then extract by you can give it an in index going back this is all if you if say we're dealing with four un, uh, unsigned int in one vector right so 0 through 4 would be integer element 0 or you can call it integer element 1 0 through 3 and then 4 through 7 would be integer element 2 so sometimes you might need to extract integer element 2 or integer element 3 from one vector and and print it so you can do that via this instruction sp underscore extract and there's a whole bunch of instructions like this and all loads and stores are one quad word at a time 16 bytes at a time there is built-in compiler directives uh, the built-in expect is used for branch prediction remember SPU does not have any hardware support for branch prediction so we try to keep the SPU hardware as simple as possible less silicon less heat less complication enforcing the 16-byte uh, loads and stores you know to removes the necessity to deal with exceptions or traps so and by and the way we enforce that that okay all data types are aligned on 16 byte boundaries is when you define a float factor use this macro aligned of 16 would align it for efficient data transfer and you can always say do a branch hint by using align underscore hint and this is an example of an SPU program so similar to the other example that we saw this is the union with consisting of four integer values and one vector unsigned uh, vector signed int and um, three vectors defined and then initialize the first vector with four values initialize the sec second vector with four values and now to add it it's uh, instead of vec underscore add the SPU would do SPU underscore add so there is a local store with the SPU processing unit and uh, this is the memory flow controller. The memory flow controller consists of a DMA queue where you can queue in the DMA requests, a DMA engine, basically it's a DMA controller, atomic facility for all, any instructions that go through MMU and uh, RMT is replacement management table. Um, and then there's a memory mapped IO registers to be uh, read and written into by the PPE. And MFC commands. Uh, the, so the memory flow controller is, is this whole, whole and sole entity responsible for all communication with any other devices, right? So on the SPEs. So the purpose of MFC commands is to basically access main storage. Two main initiatives, right? May access main storage, and then to maintain synchronization with other processors and devices in the system. Now they can be issued either uh, SPU or by the PPE, right? And basically the instructions are going through the MFC, they can either be issued by the SPE or by the PPE. And all these instructions are basically channel instructions. So anytime you're trying to do a read or a write, basically it's a read or write to the channel instructions. Uh, for the PPE though, it's always memory mapped IO instructions. So as we covered in the pre previous diagram, whenever the SPE needs to talk to the, to the basically the DMA engine, if you see the red, uh, line is the data bus it's for uh, whenever the SPU needs to talk to, to com communicate with the MFC it uses channel instructions and whenever the outside entity the PPE is existing somewhere here it needs to talk to this MFC it uses this mem memory mapped IO instructions and then all MFC commands are queued under MFC SPU command queue the proxy command queue are for the PPE initiated memory mapped IO instructions and this is some detail for your reference so all operations on any given channel, channels are strictly unidirectional. They're just message passing interfaces, basically. They're always done in program order. And you can always query the status of a channel instruction by doing reads and writes. So um, again, whenever we're talking about any DMA requests or any mailbox communication or synchronization commands, the reference point is always the SPE. So when we say get, it's into the SPE and put is out of the SPE. Uh, the, ex uh, the internal instruction for a DMA command is SPU write channel. Basically, it's a channel instruction. Composite intrinsic we just covered is a collection of one or more specific or generic intrinsic, right? FC DMA 32 is the composite intrinsic, and but the instru instru instruction that we use is a wrapper external. It's a much simpler wrapper routine is MFC get. This is the command that we will most commonly use in all the code. And these are all defined in SPU underscore MFCIO.h.
this is a syntax for MFC get. It's a simple DMA transfer command. Basically, you give the offset the local store pointer as to where you want to put the memory in or once you fetch it from the main memory. And where do you want to fetch the memory from? In, that is the effective address in the main memory space. And then how many bytes? And then assign a tag, an identifier to the memory so that if you want, or once you initiate the DMA request, you want to query if it's done or not. So the tag ID can be used to query the status of a particular uh, DMA transfer. And then transfer class ID, TID, is used when you want to change uh, or manipulate the, the transfer uh, mechanism on the bus for it. Usually it's just default. I'm not sure if it's enabled in the current SDVK development too. RID is replacement class ID. Uh, again, this is something when we, where, that we use when we're using software managed cache. There's features for fences and barriers, like a typical Linux OS supported fence and barrier. Uh, nothing different over here. It's just uh, that now we have combined that fence and barrier feature with the MF, with the DMA command, so we have more control over I.O. There's a five-bit DMA tag for all DMA commands. Again, um, so up to 32 uh, tags is what we can create. This is an example for a fence and barrier. So essentially, a uh, barrier is something, say for example, this is a green slot that is a barrier, uh, that is a DMA transfer that you have issued with a barrier option. So any preceding DMA transfers cannot be executed until this barrier instruction is done. And even succeeding DMA commands cannot be executed until this barrier instruction is executed. Versus a fence, which only stops all the preceding DMA operations to be done before this uh, particular uh, DMA transfer is finished. But any succeeding ones, any DMA issues that are issued after this fenced command can just happen fine. So that's the difference between the fence and they're like a typical fence and barrier. Transfer sizes always have to be one, two, four, eight, or multiple of 16 bytes for DMA. Maximum is 16 kilobytes per DMA transfer. 128 by kilobyte alignment is preferable for to generate, uh, to get optimum performance. The command queues are 16 element for SPU initiated requests. For PPU, it's eight element queue. There is something called uh, DMA list, which is a very excellent feature, again, that's provided on the SPEs and uh, on the cell broadband engine. It's basically a scatter gather mechanism, so by which you can get, um, you, the SPE can initiate a DMA list. In a DMA list, what it tells is it asynchronously get memory from wherever it's available in the PPE address space, in the effective address space. And that happens asynchronously while the program is executing on the previously fetched data, pre previously retrieved data. The advantage to the DMA list is that it can, so it's a kind of a solution to fragmentation in the effective address space. It will just grab wherever it is there and, and maintain it in a list and just do it, uh, process the whole data asynchronously while the execution is going on on the previously issued data. It can contain up to 2K transfer requests and each transfer request can be up to 16 kilobytes. So on a total, it can fetch 32 megabytes of data. That's the uh, API MFC get. That's a simpler API where you just specify the local store, actually the same API, the local store address, the effective address, the size, and the, the, usually these two fields are zeros. You can check the status of a DMA command by um, MFC, by, by this command, the read tag status. And this is the API, MFC write tag mask is the API to set the tag mask. Basically a tag status bit of one will indicate that no DMA requests um, tagged with that specific ID are still in uh, progress. So basically it has completed. So you can either check for, you can create multiple DMA requests with the same tag ID. So in a way you're grouping them in one category. So sometimes you want to check, make sure that all this bunch of DMA is all can be collectively addressed with one. It's like basically creating threads in one thread group. Similarly, doing all DMA transfer requests in one under one tag ID. So you can query on that tag ID to finish, to check if all DMA requests are done. So you can check on status of one tag or all tags. All DMA requests are done or not. So it's a typical example of DMA, memory to local store. So MFC get operation. Um, define the tag mask, 
and then do an MFC get operation. So it basically reads the contents from mem underscore address in the effective address space and puts it in the LS score, puts it in the uh, address pointed by LS underscore ADDR and then you check the status then make sure it's wait for all the DMA operation to be done. So that was the get and this is the put when you're read, done with the computation on the look on the SPE side you can use this instruction the MFC underscore put instruction to write it back to the main memory. And some, so why, how do you transfer data between SPE and SPE? The other SPE doesn't know what the other SPE's address is. The way you can do it is that PPE, however, knows the, all the SPE's IDs, right, and, their, and the address offsets. So what one SPE, say I'm SPU2 and I want to send data over to SPU4. So it's, there's no point sending the data over to the PPU and then PPU sending it over to the SPU4. Instead, what the SPU can do is via mailbox or some other mechanism, try to get the local store address for SPU4. So once you have the local store address for SPU4, using the same API over here, so instead of the uh, memory address, you will give the uh, local store address of the other SPU and then put it back in your own SPU address space. And tips to achieve peak bandwidth, always quad word offset aligned data requests, they always have to be aligned 16-byte um, boundary. Mailboxes, they're always 32 bits in length. Basically, the mailboxes are a really neat feature, really lightweight uh, uh, mechanism to say query status, send error code, return codes for program completion, some kind of uh, message to say, okay, I'm done, you start, or there's an error, or wait, something is wrong, something like that. So any kind of messages you can send via mailbox, 32-bit messages. So the PPE mailbox queue is uh, one deep. There is a SPE write outbound mailbox queue for all the messages that it wants to write out to the PPE. There's a write um, outbound interrupt mailbox queue, the same thing, except that after the data is written, it will generate an interrupt. And then SPU read inbound mailbox queue, uh, basically PPE would write to it, so any messages that the PPE wants to send, and then the SPE can read. And it, has, it is four deep, in other words, 16 bytes. So four 32-bit messages, 16 byte wide. This is the way the PPE again, even for mailbox, it has to interact with the MMIO registers. So this is the API. Pretty straightforward, really simple read, write API. So this is the MFC, PPE mailbox, right? One PPE mailbox is there, one PPE interrupt mailbox is there, and then SPE mailbox is there. So anytime SPE wants to say read out from the mailbox what the PPE has written for it, it can do a read out mailbox. All the SPE reads and writes to mailboxes are um, blocking. So in other words, if SPE is trying to write to the outbound mailbox that is already full, it'll halt. It'll stall, basically. So it's always a good idea to check the status, to read the channel count and see if there's any data already there in the mailbox, or if it's already full. If it's full, then you wait. Also, if SPE is trying to read from an empty mailbox, it will also stall until PPE writes something out of it, write, write something into it. So in order to avoid these stalls from the PS, from the, for, for the SPE, it's always a good idea to check, read the mailbox count and see if it's not empty or if it's not full. Versus the SP, the PPE, if PPE is trying to write to some the mailbox which is already full, it'll just overwrite the last entry, which is again not a good thing. <laughs> so you know, still, it won't halt the PPE because halting the PPE or stalling the PPE is a bad, bad idea, right? That's the only, the main, your main application is running over there. So you wanna check the status and uh, make sure you don't overwrite data. So again, this is just the API description. If the outbound mailbox is full, the channel count would be zero. So if the SPE is trying to you know, write to a full mailbox, it will remain stalled until PPE will read the message. So there's one 32-bit entry which is vacant. So there's room for write. And when the mailbox is read through the memory mapped IO address by the PPE, the channel count is incremented. Similarly, with right uh, outbound interrupt mailbox, it's the same as the right outbound mailbox, except that when the um, write is done, an interrupt is raised. So provided the interrupt is uh, enabled, 
Um, so the first entropy is serviced and then PP goes and reads the MMIO register to get the data value out of it. So to avoid the SPU stall, always read it before writing or reading, at least for the SPU. And for the PPU, if you don't want to read stale data or overwritten data, make sure you check the status. Similarly, for read inbound mailbox channel, it will stall on an empty mailbox. So all for when the SPU wants to read any message that is waiting for it in the inbound mailbox from the PPE, you know, um, make sure you read it, make sure it's not empty. Because if you try, if SP tries to read on an empty inbound mailbox, it'll stall until PP writes something to it. Okay, so this is the way to create the thread. So, uh, so when the PP is trying to, would try to create a thread, this is how it will try to create a thread. SP create thread ID. This is the group, thread group. If you have created a thread group before the creating this API, you'll pass that in. And then this is the pointer for the uh, program and then Duke is going to cover that hands on in the lab to show, look at, the, see the code and see how the SP program, basically this SP load image has to be the same name that is defined in the make SPU make file under the program underscore SPU. So it becomes a global reference. Again, the, to check the status of a mailbox, the simple API, start out mbox, pass it the SP ID, find out if there's any data. Write out interrupt mailbox is also the same. Now when the uh, SP, uh, when the PPE call is trying to call it, it will pass in the SPE ID. When the, when the SPE is trying to call it, obviously there's no SPE ID. All it needs to try to do is, when it's trying to do the write, it just sends the data to the PPE. So um, in the lab, there will be a, an example program. We're very simple. Uh, our premise is to basically uh, uh, get the message over to you on the basic mechanism on how the transfer happens and how the APIs need to be used. And we hope that you'll just build on top of it. Obviously, in real world, it won't be as simple as this. It will be much more complicated. But if we set the right ground, uh, we can be sure that uh, the, high, the real application development can uh, happen easier. OK. Um, so again, we just saw this in the previous presentation, reading into the local, local store is using the MFC get operation. So example one, there will be a get buff.c when we're covering all these examples. All it does is basically it will write an SPU program that, it will that will transfer the data into an SPU buffer from a PPU. So from the effective address space, using the MFC, the MFC get operation, it will write the data buffer and then uh, it will try to get the data into the SPU and then uh, write the data in the buffer to verify the transfer, basically just print it. So this is how the PP program would look like. I'll do all the defines, the libsp is a libsp runtime management library, and then just standard um, header files. Um, the, see, uh, right now, one thing that I want everyone to notice is in the PPU program, always you'll have to define one variable for SPE ID. This is the buffer that we are creating. The malloc call would, won't be a standard malloc call. It would be malloc underscore align. So in this case, and, and again, this definition, the support for this is there in the libmis.h header file. Uh, so malloc underscore align is saying 128 by, create 128 bytes and then align it on a 128 byte boundary, 2 power 7. So the 7 is an argument which does log 2 of the input data. So in this buffer, we're writing the data, good morning, and then creating the thread. So in this case, we have not created the thread under a group. So the first parameter is a zero. And then get buff underscore SPU is the program handle for the SPU program. And we'll be seeing that right now. Make file will look like this, the base level make file. The directory would be SPU, and then program PPU would be having this name. And then the... Um, if you see, if you notice in the imports directory, you're linking to the SPE runtime library, the MISC library for all the memory operations, and then put buff underscore SPU, which is the same as the parameter over, oh, I think it's incorrect over here. It has to be get buff. So this, this name would be re the same name as the program handle over here. And this should be, this will be created over here, SP, extern SPE program handle, get buff underscore SPU. So essentially in the PPU symbol space, this 
program handle, whatever is the SPU, you know, references will be visible to the PPU because it's embedded in the PPU executable itself. And this is the smartest way we could come up with in order to entertain the diff two different architectures by in inside only one binary. Also, to save uh, any things like inter-process calls, we don't need any IPCs, we don't need any messaging mechanisms. We want to keep it simple so that they are still visible in the, in the global address space and we don't need any explicit uh, commands so, so that we can, so that the SPU symbols are visible to PPU and vice versa. So um, get buff SPU would be the program handle or a reference to the executable, the SPU executable. The buffer is, is there is a third second parameter in the SP create thread, which is like the environment pointer, which would be sending over data if you wanted to over to the SPU code. So this is like a, we want to say, okay, I've created a thread and this is what I want the thread to do. Because the get buff underscore SP is not just a program handle, right? It's a program which gives a defined role for the thread. Like you can create the thread, but what is the thread going to do? What is its code uh, portion? The handle gives it, by creating the thread, you're actually giving the code portion to it. 